Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike McQueen. I, by way of disclosure, I am the Vice President of Medical Education for Vapotherm. Uh, prior to that, I was in clinical practice for 27 years as a neonatologist at various uh, level two, three, and four NICUs. Um, the purpose of this roundtable, in a moment, I'm going to let the guests uh, introduce themselves. Uh, the purpose of this uh, discussion panel um, is to simply discuss the role of high flow therapy in the management of the neonatal patient in the NICU. Uh, we'll hit on, on as many topics as time allows, and, and I want to thank all of you in advance for your time and expertise uh, for being here. So why don't we start with introductions. Hello, my name is the Amir Kugelman. I am the head of the neonatal department in Ramba Medical Center in Israel. I did my fellowship in LA, and I'm a neonatologist and a pediatric pulmonologist, and I'm happy to be here. So we'll discuss our experience with Vapotherm and maybe other modes of non-invasive ventilation. Hi, my name's um, Dr. Brad Yoder. I'm the division chief uh, at the University of Utah, Division of Neonatology. I am uh, <clears throat> also a professor of pediatrics there. I've been in practice for over 30 years uh, with my training in neonatal and perinatal medicine. And my predominant uh, interests are in a variety of uh, lung diseases, um, in particular BPD, and then the support of uh, babies with a variety of uh, different types of interfaces, including high-frequency conventional ventilation and non-invasive forms of um, support, including high-flow nasal cannula. Hi, I'm Brett Manley. I'm a neonatologist from Melbourne, Australia. Um, my interests uh, include non-invasive ventilation of the preterm baby and uh, ways of reducing BPD in extremely preterm pre infants. Uh, in Melbourne, we've been involved with uh, multiple studies of nasal high flow, including uh, three large randomised trials of nasal high flow use in neonatology. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> Dr. Yoder, I want to start with you. Um, this panel here is four-sevenths of a consensus group uh, that you put together to, to discuss uh, finding common ground on the use of high flow in the NICU. Could you tell us uh, the rationale for that paper and what some of the common findings were? Uh, the rationale, yeah, why take on that effort? Uh, <laughs> so I, I think the, the main reason I wanted to do it is because I kept hearing in a lot of discussions with people at a variety of uh, places, either in the hospital or in uh, conferences, that they were using high flow, but they were using it this way or that way, and they weren't sure what to do. They weren't sure where to start. They weren't sure what device to use sometimes or when to use it. And I thought what we needed uh, was a an, a an attempt with some guidelines to establish what evidence we did know is out there and what seems reasonable in terms of how to approach high flow, um, what systems should be flow rates could be potentially used, uh, how do you increase it or decrease it, and just see if we could with a, a collection of people who had spent time investigating and had a lot of clinical experience uh, with that, what was working, what the evidence was. And, and in part by doing that, we could then also establish areas where research was needed, where we just didn't have a good consensus, and that would give people then an opportunity to think, okay, these are, these are types of uh, questions that haven't really been well answered or we don't have good evidence for. And so it would be a kind of a, a, a uh, if you will, a board to kind of jump forward and move towards doing new studies, better tr new trials. Outstanding. Well, thank yeah. you for your effort in doing that. And again, could you touch briefly on what you thought the, the greatest areas of consensus were? Well, I think we all agreed that it was the, probably the best consensus was humidification and heating. Proper heating, proper humidification of gas, particularly at high flows, was absolutely critical and had to be had to be maintained. Um, we also agreed, um, although there's not really the evidence overwhelmingly to support it, that the maximum flow the baby should get would be about eight liters. Uh, and that was for the neonatal period, and there there is a different approach in older patients and in pediatric, both pediatric and adult patients. But we haven't investigated higher flow rates than that in the neonates. 
Um, we agreed that uh, it was a reasonable uh, uh, intervention uh, in comparison to CPAP alone for the support of babies who were being extubated after having been intubated and having management of their respiratory problems. And, that, uh, and then in terms of the overall approach to high flow, I think we all came to an agreement that we should treat it kind of like CPAP. It's a non-invasive form of ventilation. And if you are needing, if you have signs that the baby is not doing as well as he should be, as I .e. hear increasing contractions or increasing work of breathing or increasing respiratory rates, that more support might be indicated, as well as if FIO2 needs were going up, that more support might be indicated. And then, again, if that wasn't working, then you needed to think about other options. Thank you. I, uh, I heard that your... about right? That's about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you again. I heard your emphasis on post-extubation support. Um, Brett, one of the, the more, I think, widely cited studies as I travel around in my new role is the HIPSTER trial and, and the stark difference in high flow versus nasal CPAP as a primary therapy modality. One of the overlooked pieces I've always thought of that trial was the fact that if you have CPAP backup the rate to intubation and, and that kind of invasive support didn't seem to differ that much. Could you elaborate on that piece? Absolutely. So the HIPSTER trial was a, a multi-centre randomised trial performed in, uh, in tertiary NICUs in Australia and Norway that recruited preterm infants born between 28 and 36 weeks of gestation. So importantly, there were no extremely preterm infants uh, eligible for the trial. And in that trial, as early respiratory support, i.e. either directly from the delivery room or in the first hours of life, infants were randomised either to nasal high flow 6 to 8 litres per minute or to nasal CPAP 6 to 8 centimetres of water. And the primary outcome in that trial was treatment failure based on objective treatment failure criteria. And in that trial, we showed that high flow was inferior to CPAP at preventing treatment failure. So the rate of treatment failure was approximately 20% in the high flow group versus 10% in the CPAP group. And that was a, a 564 baby trial that was actually stopped early because we had clearly defined uh, the result of the primary outcome in the trial, i.e. that CPAP was better than high flow at preventing treatment failure. But what Mike points out is true. Once an infant had satisfied treatment failure criteria and therefore the primary outcome in the trial, they could be offered rescue CPAP. And that high flow plus CPAP backup uh, regimen meant that the secondary outcomes were very similar between the groups. And in fact, there was no difference in the rate of intubation and mechanical ventilation or in any other important respiratory type outcomes. So uh, I think we're in a little bit of a conundrum there in the sense that if the question is, is high flow as good as CPAP for preventing treatment failure in the first hours or days of life in preterm infants with respiratory distress syndrome, the answer is no. CPAP is better in our trial, the way we did it. But high flow plus CPAP backup seems to be a perfectly efficacious and safe way of treating infants. The question would be, why would you choose to do that? And centres might. They might prefer high flow, which works most of the time in most of the babies, and they might have access to multiple modes of support. So it all comes down to how you do things, cost effectiveness, money is important here. Are you going to buy both modes of support or are you just going to buy one that works better? And they're the decisions that, that clinicians need to make. Great, great. Amir, anything to add first before I ask you about your trial to the discussion so far? Anything you would add on any of the comments? Just to add as a consensus was very important because high flow went into practice before the studies came out. So then it needed to be some kind of consensus in order to, to learn from all the studies that were done. And in the consensus, people who are involved who did studies to come out with some form of treatment that we can adopt that were evaluated by randomized controlled trials because everybody was using high flow without really good data as a baseline. So it was very important to get out with a consensus. And in the future, the studies will tell if the consensus was correct or if we have to improve it. Brad, can I ask you a question without notice? In your, in your randomized trial of high flow compared to CPAP, a very pragmatic trial, babies were eligible regardless of the indication for non-invasive support, you showed that they seemed to be quite similar in their efficacy, including in the, um, 
I think about one third of babies that receive support as early support, or was it the other way around? Which one was post extubation? Yeah, it was just about thirty percent received it as the initial support, and that was with lower flows than we've used in subsequent RCTs, and yet seemed to perform better. How have you, when you when you read our studies, how do you reconcile those two results? Well, um, I agree that. Uh, we, we did start with lower flows, and, but we had a, um, a mechanism that allowed for escalation of flow with a maximum of flow going up to as high as 8 liters in the bigger babies. So it depended on the size of the baby how high we would go. And at that point in time, it was a safety consideration. We just didn't have enough data or enough evidence in, in our um, ex in our mind, even though, quite honestly, I've been using high flow for almost eight years in a, in, a, in a different environment, that I was convinced that the higher flows were necessarily safe. And so we opted to, to start lower and escalate up to a certain level um, without going above, for example, we didn't go above six liters in some of the smaller babies, even though other trials have started at higher flows and appeared to, unfortunately, in their randomized trials, they now have evidence that there wasn't any increased risk. So if I were to do it again, I would probably reach a maximum for everybody that's probably the same. Uh, but um, we did have a higher failure rate, uh, actually with both high flow and CPAP, in the arm where we started with um, that support as a primary therapy as opposed to a post-extubation therapy. If I may just add to this, we also started with low flows because there was no baseline data and you were worried about pneumothoraxes and air leaks. So just to add for this discussion that it's very important when you use the high flow to keep the leak, it's not the same like CPAP or NIPPV where you measure the pressures. When you use the high flow, there is no measurements. So you have to be very careful to allow the leak and this will make all the difference. So when we started our studies, there were no studies published. So we started low and went up. And I still, it might be a question whether it's possible if the baby does not need a lot of flow to start low and go up even fast, or to start high and win, or maybe to win the baby off the high flows immediately to spontaneous breathing. There are no good data to support each of those options. Where do you start your flows now? Now we are starting, it really depends on the, usually we don't start, it really depends. If we are starting for initial therapy, we only start on babies who don't have significant respiratory distress or significant RDS. In extreme premature infants, we only start with NIPPV, not with high flow. If we go to high flow for post-extubation, then we go between four to six. Still now, we go higher only if we need to. Most of the babies will manage with these flows. Brad? Did you say anything different? I wouldn't say much different. We typically start, um, so A, we, we do not use high flow for primary disease. Um, we use CPAP um, or non-invasive ventilation uh, and then transition to high flow. So that I, will, I probably should query that. There are some babies who we think really just have some uh, transient tachypnea. We would use high flow in that sub, subgroup of babies. But usually we start in the four to six liter range with four for the smaller babies and six for the bigger babies. And, and then that just gives us an opportunity to go up. And one of the reasons I like to start there is because a problem that happens is people get on flow, and it happens with CPAP as well. You get on a flow or a CPAP level and, and they don't wean. And I think, you know, it's just like being on a ventilator. If you can wean off, you should wean off. And so by starting at a little bit lower, they're going to wean off earlier rather than not. But if they have to escalate, well, then that's fine. Interesting. Yeah. Brett? Uh, well, as time's gone by, we've become more and more comfortable with higher flow rates, such as we've used in our randomized trials. So we, we start for whatever indication, usually six or seven litres per minute. We'd go up to a maximum of eight if required. And if that wasn't working, we'd look at the baby, look at the oxygen requirement, and consider whether high flow was not the right mode of support and we needed to change to CPAP or some other mode. 
In terms of weaning down, I agree that's a, a critical issue in how we use all of our non-invasive support and mechanical ventilation. BPD is an ongoing big problem. The definition of BPD has, has flaws, I agree. But I think as clinicians, it's our responsibility to get babies off support if they don't need it. So I agree with Brad and Amir, if a baby has clinically improved with a short-term respiratory condition, we would stop from whatever flow the baby happened to be on at the time. In the babies that need more ongoing support, we would wean by a litre per minute up to once or twice a day, depending on how the baby was doing, generally slower in the tiny babies and quicker in the bigger babies. And when we were happy with the baby's condition, we would either, we would stop it. Um, if we wanted to provide ongoing support, we'd go as low as four litres per minute and no lower and then stop the high flow. So four was your, your floor? So we started out in our early trial, we went as low as two. I think that's unnecessary and I'm concerned personally that anything down in that flow range is not providing many, very much support and it depends what you're using it for. If you just want to provide oxygen, then it will do that. But I think if you're calling it respiratory support, I think anything less than four, there's some evidence to suggest that there's not much support going on and taking into account the fact that we need to wean babies off. It, it's very important to stress that there's no need to wean the babies all the way down and that's why we've increased our minimum to four to at least partially uh, rectify that situation. Okay. Thank you. If I want just to add, it's very important when you're doing rounds and the babies are stable to keep in mind that don't just sit there, wean the baby if it's possible because studies are showing that because we are comfortable with the high flow, Baby stay more time on another support. Saying that I still, in our unit, if the baby is on four, for example, we win him instead of going to nasal cannula with outflow because this is humidified and warm and still the high flow is better than regular cannula. So if we have enough vapotens, we are using the vapotens for high flow, then I don't see why to take the baby off the vapotem if he's going to get two or three liters by nasal. So it's still wean the babies up to two, even sometimes to one liter, and it's a way of giving the oxygen, but in a safer way to protect the airways. If we have shortage of equipment, then we take the babies off. But the idea is it's still safer and better for the airway to have warm and humidified air, even if it's low flows. We don't call it high flow. Less than two liters is considered low flow, but still we use it because it's a good method of supporting the babies. Yeah, I, I agree with that practice and uh, in our centre low flow is quite low so we would heat and humidify anything over about two or three hundred mils per minute actually. Most of our babies aren't on a litre or two litres of unhumidified so I agree we would preferentially use high flow in that situation and more and more of our extremely preterm infants with evolving chronic lung disease who have an oxygen requirement are staying on high flow until they're sort of 34 weeks gestation and then we try and switch them over to low flow. Good. One of the statements, Brett, that you made that I agree, all of us agree wholeheartedly with, is it's our obligation to minimize support in whatever way we can, min minimize the, the invasiveness. Um, towards that end, one of the differentiators in the trials that have shown clear um, inferiority of high flow to nasal CPAP and the ones that have not has been the inclusion of surfactant in, uh, in before the primary outcome measures. I'm thinking specifically of, of Lavazari's trial and of Kugelman's trial. And since you're sitting here, Amir, go, go there. Tell, tell me about the role of surfactant. Well, basically, I want to say two things about this. First, I believe, and the studies show, that NIPPV is better than CPAP for initial treatment to prevent intubation and post-extubation. So I think the goal in future studies will have to evaluate the high flow versus NIPPV, not only against CPAP, because at least in our hands, NIPPV is better, and it was shown also by Cochrane analysis. And my study was to compare the high flow comparing it to NIPPV. Mm -hmm. In most, in both our studies, CPAP versus NIPPV and APAP, NIPPV versus high flow, we didn't give surfactant before using the NIPPV. It was in initial mode. This is opposed to the study of Lovisari, which she gave the surfactant. So this might change all the attitude because maybe the surfactant is helpful and then the results might change and high flow may get place. 
but in our study we used for initial treatment NIPPV versus high flow and surprisingly I would say because I was expecting to have better results with the NIPPV there was no difference between the group but the study included only around 80 patients around 40 in each group and it was relatively larger babies so I think we need more studies on extremely premature infants and infants who have more severe lung disease. Yeah, great. Brett, mm-hmm. go there on surfactant. <laughs> well, I, you know, it, 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 uh, <clears throat> it begs to study design, so uh, uh, it complicates things. I think, to me, uh, a, a, pure, a more pure study would be to say, okay, we're going to randomize to either CPAP, not NIMV, or high flow post, post surfactant therapy. So it becomes more like an insure um, a methodology where you're saying, okay, we now, you know, we're managing our baby non-invasively with whatever, but now once we've said we're going to give them surfactant, now let's randomize them to one arm or the other. And there are, I think, one or two trials out there which actually have looked at that that are small uh, that suggest in that, in the face of that, there's probably a similar type of outcome. The problem becomes, um, it, it's just confusing to me uh, to say, um, we had similar outcomes. We didn't have any. The problem I have is failure. To me, if you have to intubate a patient and give them surfactant, they have failed your therapy. And so at that point in time, it now becomes a different, different study. And I think it's very important for people who are using any of these things that they, they really critically analyze the study populations that are involved in whatever study. Because, you know, the hipster had a, a, a slightly different study population in terms of the uh, respiratory support that was required than 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 uh, Anna Lavazari study had, which tended to have a higher, so there was a higher failure rate in her study relative to Brett's study, but there was a difference in the population also mm-hmm. that was being looked at. So it was really important to to look at those and then look at your how you're applying it in your own practice. Yeah, it's very important, especially when you look for the long term the BPD. We know that if a baby was intubated and got positive pressure ventilation via the ET tube, it affects the long-term outcome. And a lot of studies are doing some combination of non-invasive and surfactant. If the baby was intubated, and then they say that CPAP or NIPPV does not affect the, B- the BPD rate. But still, if you intubate the baby, it might have an effect. And in any case, in most of the studies, we support the baby, some studies for three days and then the babies go to any other mode, CPAP or NIPP, or only seven days. And for if you have a 24 weekend, after three days, seven days, you change the mode of randomization, then you can't look at long term because the babies are not on the same mode for a long time. So really you have to clean the studies and to evaluate studies who are clean, surfactant, no surfactant, intubation, no intubation. You can't call a baby that's not intubated if it was intubated only for less than 24 hours. So it's very important to have clean data to come out with good conclusions. Yeah. Brad, do you use the insure method when you have to intubate them for surf? Then do you take them right back off of it? Is that to me? I was to you. I'm sorry. Do, yeah. do we use the insure method? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Well, we're pretty comfortable with that. Uh, but I will say that as of right now, um, our general approach is that we, if we intubate a baby to give them surfactant, we actually extubate them to CPAP. Okay. And uh, and then they would transition at some point to high flow, or if they get really, really, if they have a really positive response, they may end up on a regular cannula. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, that's our current approach. Brett, your current practice now to you, when, when uh, they reach treatment failure, Require, which is as you're defining it now. I'm going to push back on that just a little bit, recognizing as another disclosure that when this is over, I'm going to get all three of your autographs. You've contributed more than, than I will ever contribute, and, and thank you for that. But but treatment failure, if you have to intubate to give surfactant, do you leave the tube in? Uh, at the moment, we do. That's been our practice. Now, we're part of a randomized trial looking at a way of giving surfactant with a minimally invasive technique or less invasive technique, if that's what you'd like to call it. So uh, some babies are in that randomised trial, but our standard practice in extremely preterm babies would be to intubate them and leave them on a mechanical ventilator, but with the aim to get them off as quick as we could. Mm -hmm. The reality is that that's normally a day or two before they actually get the tube out. So it's not, not an inshore method per se. 
Um, I think, though, the way of the future will be less invasive surfactant administration or minimally invasive surfactant. We're just uh, in a randomised trial and we'll get that done and then we'll make our decisions about how we're going to approach that situation. But yeah. on the topic of surfactant, I absolutely agree with Amir and Brad that as soon as you give a baby surfactant, it's a different baby and uh, you can't lump trials that have given surfactant or haven't all together. And I think we need to be very mindful of that going forward with updating the Cochrane review and meta-analyses, how we treat different trials that have or haven't used surfactant or allowed surfactant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree with the three of you more on, on that. It is a different patient once you've administered, administered surfactant, and in my mind, that's kind of the whole point. Mm. I, I'm not sure. Especially if you administer, yeah. especially if you administer surfactant via ADTU give positive breath ventilation, the baby yes. is changed. And we know the yes. studies that That's even right. few breaths via a tube makes a difference. Yeah. I'm, I'm old enough, I've been in practice long enough, that I practiced before surfactant was available as a tool. And I, I certainly don't want to go back there again. I'm not sure in my mind that I have ever considered having to give surfactant to a surfactant deficient infant, a treatment failure. I don't think I would say that. I can't, it's certainly from trial design, you design it as you see fit and as a primary outcome, I, I understand that completely. From a pragmatic at the bedside standpoint, I, I, I'm not sure why I wouldn't give a surfactant deficient infant surfactant and I would do it sooner. I'm not gonna let him get respiratory fatigue or, or damage lung tissue as exposed to higher volume trauma, NFIO2, both in, in doing that. Brad, when you do it, how early are you giving it? It's quite variable. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's extremely variable. <laughs> I wish there was a consistent approach, and, and we've, we've certainly tried to build written guidelines in our units for all of these things. But That's everybody our next kind consensus, of, maybe. Yeah. kind of takes their own, uh, you know, approach as to does this meet our criteria or not. I think we've inched down some in terms of they're on a significant amount of CPAP support, and their FI2s creeped up, used to be up to 50. Now we're actually down to 40, where mm -hmm. we, we say we, we might as well give it to them earlier rather than later, particularly in the more mature baby. Now in the more immature baby, we actually probably end up doing more what Brett does, is if they get surfactant in their 24, 25 weeks, even 26 weeks, they're probably going to stay intubated for a longer period of time yeah. Yeah. to make sure that they have the response and to make sure they have the respiratory drive and then be uh, subsequently extubated. Uh, so in the very small babies, if they end up just wearing out, they get tired, they get, whenever they get intubated, they get surfactant. It's just, that's fair enough. what yeah. they're going to have. Amir, uh, your criteria, what do you do? Well, we're uh, uh, trying to have some protocol. The idea is after delivery, the babies are the premature infants, the smaller ones are going to, on NIPPV, if the babies go Above 30%, we are trying to give less invasive ventilation, a surfactant therapy, and then we take the, try to take the babies off. If the baby were not placed in the study, and it's, we are using the, not, the less invasive only within a study, if the baby goes above 40 or between 35 to 45%, we are using the intro. And if the baby does not look stable while we are doing it, or some practical issues, if it's during the night time, if we are not sure about the resident who is going to stay with the baby because we have residents at night, but the, maybe the baby might stay on the vent until the next day. And then the next day, it really depends not only on his lungs, but depends how active the baby is. If we think that the baby can be taken off the ventilator or he should stay. But the idea, we are trying to use less invasive surfactant therapy only within a study. If not, we are trying to use the intro, but within practical situation in the department. You have to remember that not only a study, we are taking care of babies. Well and said. people are involved and people, some people are younger than others and we have to take, to consider this. Well said. Yeah, you've all alluded to the importance of respiratory drive. I guess that's a, a given that maybe we shouldn't assume in this format is, is a given everywhere. The, the single biggest contraindication to high flow is, a, is a lack of, of adequate respiratory drive in, in my mind. I think that's why the 24 and 25 weekers are a whole different different population, and, and I, I would concur. I, I think if those babies need elevated support, escalated support, I, I would wager most of us would do the same thing and, and leave them on that support longer. So, so good distinction on that. 
I think that we have to remember that the high flow, even when we get CPAP, it's not exactly like CPAP with CPAP and IPPV. Because we keep a leak. This is by definition. This is what the recommendation is. If the baby has significant RDS, if it's extremely premature infants, I think it's understandable that CPAP or NIPPV are better than high flow. We don't have studies on the smaller infants, but even in the biggest uh, infants, it's still shown that CPAP is better than high flow. So if we are ready to allow the baby to fail and be uh, escaped with ensnazzled CPAP or rescued with CPAP and IPV, it's okay, but I usually don't like very extreme infants to fail because you don't know if they fail, if the lung collapses, it might be demanding and open to open the lungs and we are not sure what's going to happen. And in this stage, if they are in the first three days of life, there is a problem of IVH and you don't want to play with the baby. We don't want them to fail. We want to keep as much a stable baby if it's possible. So the option of rescue in the smaller premature infants, I'm not sure if it's safe enough, but we don't have that on this. On bigger infants, it's an option. And really, we don't have an option for the most extreme infants on, with rescue therapy. One more question on this, then we'll switch topics a little bit. Tell me where you draw that line, the mirror between smaller infant and bigger infants, and then I'm going to ask both of you the same. It's the studies, most of the studies on high flow were done on infants who were larger than 1,000 grams. Most of the studies were done on those infants. And infants, even in the hipster, the infants were relatively large, ending up with infants, right? right. The infants were relatively large. So I think 25 up to 20, 24 up to 27 weeks are from me still extreme premature infants. And I would, even below 28, I would try to use NIPPV or another CPAP instead of high flow as initial therapy. Okay. Brad? Yeah, I think um, in my interpretation of the data that's out there to date is that the best, what we do is we will not usually offer high flow as a primary therapy to babies less than 28 weeks. Uh, they can eventually get onto that depending on their course, but we don't use it as the primary support. Um, and that's perhaps a bias as as well as my my biased interpretation of the literature as well as my biased interpretation of our clinical practice. So. Fair enough. Brett, same question. I, I totally agree. There's, there's a, a paucity of data for extremely preterm infants for the efficacy of high flow. Um, so we would use CPAP as our first line non-invasive support for all of our extremely preterm infants. And also after extubation, we would extubate extremely preterm infants to CPAP or NIPPV. Uh, and uh, so that we seem fairly consistent on that. Um, in terms of primary support, uh, we've got the HIPSTER trial and the HUNTER trial coming, uh, and I think we wait to see the results of all of that together, but at the moment I wouldn't recommend using um, high flow as primary support for preterm infants with RDS based mainly on the results of HIPSTER. Uh, whether there are some infants that high flow may be highly successful in is something that we're trying to tease out now. Are there ways we can predict which babies need the CPAP con constant distending pressure versus might be alright on the high flow? And I think we're still working our way through that. So it, as it stands, CPAP for me. Great, great. Thank you all very much. Completely different topic. I get asked this all over the country when I travel. Can you feed babies on high flow? Especially now that there seems to be some consensus that high flow means five liters, six liters, even seven and eight liters per minute on, on some pretty tiny babies. Do you feed them and, and how? Brett, let me start with you. Uh, well, in, firstly, I'd say there's no large randomized trials uh, of feeding babies on high flow versus any other mode of support. Um, when you do look at the randomized trials that have been done, though, there doesn't seem to be any problem in terms of high flow use and nutritional or weight outcomes. In our unit, which is anecdotal, uh, we are very comfortable with, with baby suck feeding either at the breast or the bottle on high flow at any flow rate. So if they're ready to have suck feeds and they're on high flow, they have suck feeds. Great. Yeah. It's very reassuring to hear. Brad? So, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, there, there, there are no randomized, large randomized trials. There was actually, a, there's a study that is 
presented um, in a post form, I believe, at this meeting, uh, comparing high flow to CPAP uh, and the uh, ability to effectively oral feed, which uh, basically, as I recall, suggested mm, they were they were probably fairly similar, but there there's it's completely dependent upon the patient uh, and their readiness and their ability. Um, I, I think what would what we need, we just need more information, and and we do, we do PO feed some of our babies uh, who are on high flow. Most of them then tend to be the larger babies, so 34 weeks and above, who are clearly have good cues, are on it, um, and are stable. Um, and we've done it up as high as six liters. We typically are. Our, our feeding specialists, our speech therapists, uh, occupational therapists, they they push me to say, why don't you wait until he gets to three liters or two liters or whatever. But I say, you know, if he's ready to go, he's ready to go. And, and if he doesn't do well, then that's fine. We can pull back. But I, I would like to see more investigations of that, particularly using techniques that can actually assess the suck swallow technique, as well as a, a randomized trial that has a specific uh, population um, data set that says, uh, you know, inclusion, exclusion criteria that really give us an idea of whether it yeah. is or is not a, um, an A, effective and B, safe. Yeah. And hearing you say that, I should probably add the, add the caveat that whilst I said we would feed babies on high flow, that's true. I think by the time they're getting ready to feed and we're in the 34, 35 week range, it's, it's very rare for a baby to be on high flow at a high flow rate, um, they would generally be towards the lower end yeah. of our spectrum, yeah. four, five, or six liters at that time. Um, and mo mainly, the sicker babies are still on CPAP in our unit. So uh, I, I think that's important to say that whilst I've said that you could feed a baby on high flow, the truth is most of them would be on that medium yeah. to low flow rates. Some of the places, before I get to you, Mir, some of the places are even asking about gavage feeds on high flow. Any issue with that? Absolutely not. Good. Gavage feed a baby on any mode of respiratory we, we, any mode of respiratory our, support. Yeah. Our, our emphasis is to uh, increase uh, enteral feeds as quickly as possible, uh, and uh, we don't have problems with that. I wanted to hear this. Say it, Amir. Your your practice. Two two factors are playing a role. First, the acuity of the distress of the baby is on high flow, and he's still in distress. He's not getting PO feeding because he can't eat PO in any mode, even if he's spontaneously breathing, but the rate of breathing is 60, 80, he's not getting PO feeds. And usually this time, when the baby is ready to be fed, and he still needs high flow, it must be a baby who is like chronic, like a BPD patient, and those we are allowing them to feed PO if they have the possibility to eat if they want to. So this is still anecdotal because if he has a BPD and he's not in distress and he can try to feed, we allow him to do it. But it's still the bigger babies and not in the acute stage. Great. Thank you. Tina just gave me the heads up that we're a little over 30 minutes and I made a time commitment to you all. So I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll stop. Uh, tell me delivery room management. I'm clearly interested in the role of high flow in the delivery room. But independent of that, what, what, what do you do? Brett, start us. Uh, well, well, now that it's on my mind, I might mention that, that there are some centres around the world who are using high flow in the delivery room to stabilise even extremely preterm infants. I know Peter Reynolds and the group from Surrey in the UK have published a case series in 20-something uh, very preterm infants showing that most of the time in their units, in their hands, very experienced with using yeah. high flow, that that can be a successful uh, method of stabilisation. It's not a randomised trial and it's a small case series. Um, we're not using high flow in the delivery room. It's something I'd like to look at, and that's where surfactant would come in again. I, uh, you know, whatever mode of support you want to give to the baby and then give them surfactant, I think you're going to increase your chances of subsequent therapy being successful. Um, in our delivery rooms, extremely preterm infants are managed with uh, Neopuff via mask. If they're spontaneously breathing, they'll go on to CPAP. Uh, via binasal prongs, and that's how they'll be transported to the neonatal intensive care unit. If they're not spontaneously breathing despite resuscitative efforts or have a very high oxygen requirement, they'll be intubated. We, we're not normally giving surfactant in the delivery room unless absolutely indicated, i.e. the baby was hypoxic despite 100% oxygen. Usually we'd wait until the intensive care unit, and if the baby went up to the unit intubated, and I'm talking extremely preterm infants, they would all get surfactant in the first few hours of life, if not sooner. 
But wherever we could, we would leave a baby on, on CPAP support in those first hours of life and see how they go until they reached whatever our, our criteria for intubating and giving surfactant are. Excellent. Amir, let me skip to you and I'm going to give Brad the last word today. So we are not using high flow in the delivery room. Usually we use the nail puff and so the baby has to go to the unit with support is going with NIPPV using a binasal prone, so we started to use the ram cannula to take the baby to the unit. So we are currently not using high flow in the delivery room. Good deal. Brad? <laughs> Um, well, we do not use high flow in the, well, first of all, we don't even go to the delivery room. Our units are set up so that the delivery rooms are but our NICU, so we actually admit the babies directly into the NICU and resuscitate them on their bed. Outstanding. And then we don't have to move them any anymore. Um, I, I think the, you know, again, Peter Reynolds has had, has reported really good success. It's important to understand um, how he's how he does it, and, and, and he does, and I've talked with him about it. He does not have equipoise in terms of wanting to do a trial because he feels like he's had a lot of success with it. I think a, tr uh, no, a trial needs to be done, um, and, and given that he has had some positive uh, results with his, it would seem like that would be an unacceptable to me an acceptable trial to entertain. But it's important, and it, it may also relate back to CPAP alone or nasal INV alone is that what he does is he, he it's the very first thing he does so when the baby comes out he's actually applying that therapy even as the baby's beginning to try to take their first breath and uh, you know there's there's none of this suctioning stimulating drying it's so that the support is there as soon as that baby breathes and it's pretty clear from most of the animal studies that have been done and even from some of the small human trials that have looked at it with with um, um, electrical impedance tomography, that the baby's breath is much more effective than our ability to bag, mask, breathe for them. So if you have that support in place, you're probably going to be more effective than if you don't have it in place. And if you even wait three or four or five or six breaths, and you know, quite honestly, I get a little frustrated when it takes us 30 seconds to put CPAP on. It's like, why don't we have that CPAP on that baby as soon as we get them on the bed and that's the first thing that they get, again, supporting them. So um, we don't use it. I think it should be studied. I think there's the potential. Um, and, and it's surprising how small a patient population he's actually been able to find efficacy uh, with his approach in. Um, but it should, if it's going to be done, it's going to have to be done in, you know, really paying very careful attention as to how you're applying it, when you're applying it, and what else you do. Because it's not just one therapy, it's all of these things that we do together that really contribute to the, to the outcome that we're trying to, to, to prevent over in the long run, which is, is generally is BPD. Yeah. And of course it has to be compared to methods that use give PIP or CPAP up to the baby. Yeah, absolutely. For the babies, absolutely. after the delivery, even the full with fluids, you can't compare high flow to no support. No, no, you have no. To compare no, right. high flow to CPAP and everything. Yeah, very complete. Right. Well, all of us have in common trying to be as least least invasive on the infant as we can, uh, minimize support, and as we develop the different arrows in our quiver and the technology and techniques to to do that. You know, it'll it'll be fun to watch this evolution. Again, I can't thank the three of you enough, and I mean this sincerely, for the contributions that you have made and, and are continuing to make. And in terms of giving your time on this, this discussion panel, these gentlemen have come from across the globe. They're jet lagged, they're tired, and they're in high demand. So I, I very much appreciate you uh, taking time for this. We have been able to uh, take our preterm lamb model and completely non-invasively support them. No, we and we do we do I don't want to call it minimally invasive, but I guess it's minimally invasive. So how do you do it? Huh? Well, when we so the nice thing about the lamb is you can deliver the lamb and bring his head out, do anything you want to him while he's still attached to the fetal circulation and doesn't care. And so they get a little they get a little tiny cannula that gets put in, um, uh, similar to this less invasive minimally invasive surfactant thing. Then we deliver them, and then we, we have a cone mask that goes over them, and we use 
um, a, uh, it's actually a, a, a modified high frequency nasal ventilation with sustained lung inflation enclosed okay. in there. And then, depending on what criteria they meet, at some point in time, if they require surfactant, they get it through this little cannula, but we never intubate them. And then, subsequently, that cannula will come out, and then we try, try to continue them on. And then, but eventually, they end up, uh, you know, our target is at 15 minutes, about 30 minutes, having them completely on a nasal pharyngeal tube with high-frequency nasal ventilation. And we use the use the Drager high frequency. We can use that in the lab. We can't use it in humans, but we can use it in the lab. And um, uh, we support them with that. Boy, they have nice looking lungs when they're all done. But it's taken a lot. And we use fairly large doses of caffeine. But I know you guys that are or the group down in I guess in Melbourne have been using some doxaprine as part of that. Which, yeah. 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 Yeah, for, for my experience, and again, I'm, I'm one of those um, who's not nearly, you know, as, as published. I've done some collaborative publishing just thanks to the, the graciousness of you all, including me on some of these. It, it, it's harder from a community facility. Some of them have IRBs, some of them don't. Uh -huh. Some of the systems have IRBs. In fact, I would say all of the systems have IRBs, and there's certainly access to it. Um, funding for a, for a you know, non-academic center is, is essentially non-existent. That's where places like Vermont Oxford have been really valuable for us to be able to collaborate under an umbrella like that and, and, and do some trials. Um, and it's true, you know, you get incredibly committed to, to what you're doing. I watched the machinations that the gent from Columbia went through on affixing the, the CPAP interface and thought only if you're committed to that would you go to all of that. They spend as much time trying to make sure the CPAP interface is there and not damaging and not traumatic as, as they do delivering the therapy. It was remarkable. I tipped my hand. For me, the difference was, was changing the patient population from a surfactant deficient one to a surfactant treated one. We don't do it prophylactically anymore. Um, we, we used to do that fairly routinely. There was a time, correct me if I'm wrong, when that was recommended for babies less than 20 weeks or something. Um, but but if they if they have severe retractions, if their X-ray looks looks granular, if if their FiO2 has gone from 25 to 30 percent in the last hour and a half, we don't wait. We, we go. We we know what's coming. He's going to get worse. Let's don't let him, and and give the surf extubate right away to the high flow. And we've just had incredible success. I, I think part of it is the fact that the nurses are so bought in. There was a year when vapotherm was taken off the market. Uh, 2006, yeah. to be precise, and in a way that sealed the deal in all of my NICUs. The nurses went crazy. They hated that we had to go back to nasal CPAP. Yeah. We still use that, by the way. We use RAM cannula, we use the ventilator, we use the oscillator, we use, we use all the arrows in the quiver. Um, but, but from a non-invasive standpoint, I can hardly wait for aerosolized surfactant to, to be widespread. Do you guys know anything about that that you can share? Is it coming? It takes a long time. It yeah. takes hours to, to, to administer. I missed the talk yesterday. Did we, was anyone at the talk? In I, the, I missed right it here? too. And I didn't he, he didn't talk about the time needed, but I'm sure there is a lot of waste of surfactant because we saw even in the film that was demonstrating that surfactant came out of the nose during the aerosol, aerosolation. So get distal distribution. There's a yeah. lot of waste because it doesn't yeah. go only to the lungs. And the other interest is in LMAs, is that laryngeal mask airways. So yep. just yep. Plonk, plonk it in the uh, upper yep. airway and see yep. what happens. That's so. intriguing. Let them yeah. aspirate. I mean, stuff. I'm, I'm really fascinated with the, that less invasive technique. Yeah. The, and, and, and I'm always, when people are doing trials, or I get one of them, I'm saying, okay, now how do you guys do this? Because you know, we have residents, they don't know how to intubate. We have NNPs, half the time yeah, they don't know how yeah, to intubate. Yeah, yeah. And and I think it really takes somebody who's a skilled intubationist to be able to sit there and have it in position and do it while this baby's on the seat. Yeah. 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 yeah, it can be tricky. It, it, it is tricky. Yeah. It absolutely is tricky, but the centers that are used to doing it, it just becomes yeah. standard. No, I mean, I think the yeah. data clearly supports yeah. that. Yeah. If you can do less invasive ventilation, it seems to be the future. And use this le or less invasive surfactant in combination with non invasive support, you're going to get the best. Yeah, outcomes. if the baby is on 30%. In the previous studies, we waited, uh, we waited until the baby was on 50%, and then only we intubated yeah. and we yeah. give surfactant. 
Now, if you give a surfactant when the ba- non-invasively when he's thirty percent, then maybe the babies might be better. It's interesting that. Are you doing a non-invasive? Yeah, we are part of the study. Are you part of their study? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's why we're not going to study for the Australian preterm babies, yeah. which probably finishing soon. But we're okay. introducing mist. We're calling it um, mm. same thing uh, in our more mature babies. But interestingly, the, the oxygen threshold for failure comes down because yeah. the the out, the complication is less. You're not yeah, yeah. putting the baby on the ventilator, yeah, so right, right, why yeah. not give the surfactant yeah. earlier? No, so it's, it's, got, it's, it's idea, a combination yeah. of not only giving the surfactant, but yeah. giving but it earlier. Yeah, yeah. Still, it's yeah. a worry if you decide if the baby is sitting, let's say, on 35%. And it's doing relatively yeah. okay, just heart rate, heart rate and respiratory rate are a bit increased and some retractions. You sit and usually they'll come down and be okay. Mm-hmm. If you've tried to play with the with and give surfactant with the intro or with the miss is always the question if the babies are going to suffer it or if you've made a decision it doesn't go well you well you decide to intubate sure. while he's doing bradycardia or you didn't yeah. succeed with the yeah. with the surfactant going into the lungs it went to the stomach instead yep. to into the lungs and then you decide to be more invasive and you put the tube in instead of going to 50 percent not touching the baby and come yeah. down you're start trying to intervene and usually we have residents at night, so if the baby is on 35, 40 percent, so it's not really, if he's not in a study, I'm not going to touch him. So I let him go and the morning will decide, because this is practice in life. If it's in a study, if it's in more than 70 percent, we'll go on and play with I'll come in. So that's, that's why it's so, very important. So, so that was my question, who's, who's doing it? <laughs> yeah, well, as we introduce it, it's the consultants, it's consultants it's the yeah. attendings, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to roll it out eventually to the, yeah. to the yeah. fellows, yeah. the advanced trainees, but um, it will be a consultant led thing at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it has to be at this, that's how it, I would per- perceive it in our centers, it would have to be the, the attendings doing it to begin with, kind of, yeah. I think it almost has to be to start. Yeah. You have you have to. I mean, there's a. It is a patient at the end of the trial. You got to be safe. Yeah. 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 And, and is your study with CPAP or with nasal ventilation? The Optimus trial is using CPAP. CPAP. Yeah, but yeah. you are allowed. We are also yeah. part of the Optimus. We are allowed to use NIPP. Uh, sorry, or NIPP. Oh, you are allowed to use either way. Yeah, yeah, I, could go, preference. I couldn't go it's to your center NIPP. preference. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. you are allowed. Yeah. I went into the study because this is a way to learn the method. Uh, it, yeah, no, it obliges you to idea. go into it. Yeah, yeah. If not, then it's never convenient. But if it's in right. a study and it's yeah. more than 70%, you have to, to do it. No, I'm yeah. tempted so. to see how I can bring it into our practice, but uh, I'll okay. wait until your study's done. <laughs> Almost done. Hopefully. The thing we're going to be but doing now, we're going to be doing some uh, trials, that starting a trial with uh, uh, nasal jet ventilation mm-hmm. compared to nasal ventilation. With standard CPAP prongs. Good. Peter Remensberger is doing now a study with high frequency, nasal high frequency international studies. So, that's CPAP and we'll see. Yeah, I don't know what his interface is. Do you know? He's using a we, RAM. We're going to use a. Not to RAM cannula, using, using the Hudson or the Inca prongs. Yeah, we're going to be using a uh, nasal, uh, mm. soft nasal pharyngeal tube, which is. But we've used it. We usually before. don't use it. We use the binasal prongs. Yeah. Oh. No, but this we're using binasal prongs for C, for the yeah. na- non-invasive uh, for the standard nasal ventilation. But what we use in our preterm sheeps is we use a single hmm. nasal pharyngeal tube, and it works really well.